Alrighty, first off, um, this lecture is going to be given in person on Veterans Day, um, Armistice Day. So this is a very timely lecture uh, in the grand scheme of things because uh, tomorrow we will be celebrating the end of the Great War and veterans in the United States and their service. So without further ado, uh, let's look at our new lecture on the topic of America in the Great War. Now the Great War in our textbook follows 12.1 to 12.3. Um, so it's pretty short. Uh, the United States just doesn't spend a lot of time in the Great War. Uh, we come in towards the very end. Um, but anyways, what I'm going to do first is give you some background information on what causes um, World War I. Uh, and let's get it started with that. Essentially, in 1914, um, all the things we've been talking about up to this point, militarism, nationalism, the buildup of armies, imperialism, um, these things are leading towards a circumstance where the world could go into a global conflict. Um, essentially, there's a lot going on. Uh, even though America is getting more involved in the world, we still maintain kind of a neutral isolationist um, trend. However, uh, there's going to be a spark that kind of changes everything in the world and puts industrialized nations into direct conflict with each other. Um, that's kind of the basic idea. So if you had to run it down as a basic list, what sets the stage but doesn't actually start the war? But what sets the stage is nationalism, imperialism, a lot growing alliances, uh, and what was the other one? industrialization. These, all these factors play together to kind of create a circumstance where if industrialized nations get into conflict, it's going to get very ugly very quickly. But not a lot of people realize that at the start. Um, this is just kind of the breakup of how Europe is going to get into World War I, who's fighting on whose side. Since this is a U.S. history class, we're not going to go into as much detail over who, which, when, which side, which country enters the war on which side. We're going to focus more on the generalizations and where the U.S. plays a role. But um, industrialization is a major factor because while the United States is industrializing, so is Germany, so is Japan, so are other places. Now to get you an idea of the, the scale of the conflict, uh, Germany has the largest army in the world at this time. Um, whereas Russia is the second largest and France holds third. Uh, you'll notice that Britain and the United States maintain particularly small armies, and that's partially because ours are volunteer units, uh, volunteer, volunteer militaries. Whereas in Germany uh, and Russia and France, uh, military service was expected of all men uh, when they were at a certain age, and they could be pulled back into service. Um, at any point. You'll notice Austria-Hungary is a bit lacking, but that's because Austria-Hungary has never truly recovered from the um, from their fight against Prussia, and militarily they're trying to get their military up and running is a logistical nightmare that deserves its own lecture. Anyways, you see the other big build-up in this time period is warships. Uh, Britain has the largest fleet in the world, but remember it's spread, spread across that world. This, the empire where the sun never sets means these ships are going to be spread pretty far apart. Um, over here we've got Germany. It's been building up with its warships with one intention, defeat the British Empire. Germans believe um, in World War I that they need to take their rightful place as the colonizing world power that Britain holds. And, well, you can't share, so one um, as imperialism states, if I can't hold it, if I don't hold it, someone else is going to use it against me. And so the Germans feel that it is time for them to take what is British and make it theirs. Um, here's the major lists of who's who in this war. The Allied powers are going to be mainly France, Britain, and Russia. Um, the reason I don't talk about as much about these ones is Italy changes sides. They originally start in the Central Powers, but they switch teams when they um, get sufficiently bribed. Serbia may be where the war starts, but um, it's more of a cause than really 
a huge factor. It does tie down some German and Central European and um, Austrian troops, though. Uh, France is where most of the fighting is going to take place. France and Belgium in, on the Western Front. Um, but and the Central Powers, you've got Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Um, Germany is going to be the main. Um, most historians agree, most people in this time period agree, that Germany will be the spine of the Central Powers. Um, these are the neutral countries, or some of the neutral countries. Um, so while it is a world war, um, there's just not as much. Uh, Japan's on the Allied side. It does a few things at the start of the war, but pretty much it all Germany's colonies in Asia are taken within about six months to a year of the war breaking out. And the U.S. comes to the party late. Anyways, um, naturally this is just a master map of the war. There's two major fronts in Europe. There is the Western Front. This is the Trench Front, which everyone thinks of. Then you've got the Eastern Front, which we don't hear as much about. Um, but it's a very interesting one. I've been reading a book on it, and it's a lot's going on on the Eastern Front. Um, the Western Front, mm, there's stuff going on, but no one's moving very much. But we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, there's also an Italian front in the Alps, but that comes up later. Now, the war, when this war breaks out, the United States um, wants to be neutral. Uh, we have a lot of people in this country who came to America to get away from Europe's wars. And this was just, at first at least, seen as a, just another one of Europe's uh, little wars. However, it increasingly blows out of proportion. Um, essentially, what starts the war is an imperialistic issue. Um, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in Sarajevo by Serbian terrorists of the Black Hand. And so many, many Americans are, uh, at least at first when the war breaks out, are kind of like, eh, well, we don't really care about Central Europe. Um, there are some different ethnic groups that are, like the Germans are rooting for the Germans, the British are rooting for the British, the French are rooting for the French. But really in wider American society, at least at the start, there's just kind of this, well, it's, it's another war, let's watch this one from a safe distance. Um, as long as America isn't threatened, we don't really particularly care. Um, now, there is a, there is a bias. Um, the United States uh, businesses be benefit tremendously from this war. Uh, at the start of the war, we start selling weapons to the Central and, Al and the Entente. And um, as the war deepens in its conflict, the British Empire realizes that the United States, if it remains impartial, is going to be a problem in the wrong, long run. And so essentially the British, uh, through British through diplomacy, kind of negotiate this idea of you can remain neutral, but quit shipping to the central powers, quit selling stuff to the central, the central powers like Germany and Austria, Hungary. So we kind of get stuck on that. Um, but you can see these are some ships uh, moving cargo. Now, naturally, the Germans were very upset because while the United States feared the British Navy, we didn't take the German Navy quite as seriously. Uh, the Germans had a new piece of technology called the U-boat. The U-boat is a submarine. It's German for Unterseeboot, um, or underwater boat. Anyways, the German U-boat is used to incredible effectiveness to target American shipping. Um, especially after they declare unrestricted, unrestricted submarine warfare, where basically if you're going to Britain, you're going to be sent to the bottom of the ocean. Um, the United States didn't take too kindly to that. So as new technologies emerge, um, convoys and other methods are developed to try and counteract U-boats. Um, the United States used convoys to get through U-boat, all these U-boat sinkings, um, by basically having the mentality, if you have a bunch of ships moving together, um, for one thing, the German U-boats only carry so many torpedoes. 
Another thing is more more ships out there have more eyes to look out and see maybe spot a U-boat before it come before it attacks. And so that's the idea behind uh, behind convoys is the United States is trying to make money off of this war and the Germans really don't appreciate us making money at their expense. But I apologize for how quick this war goes um, or how quick this lecture is moving um, through some more topics that people really want to want to hear. But now there are some changes as even as the United States remains neutral, the US government gradually realizes that it needs to um, adjust things a bit to be more efficient. And so like some of the things that the US government does is it puts together um, a regulating industry, agricultural production. Um, we start developing propaganda and even prepare for the war by setting up a new draft. Um, also, as this war breaks out, more and more people are moving around in the United States looking for new work opportunities. Uh, because essentially, as we become the suppliers of the world in this conflict, American, American wheat goes into French bread uh, to feed the troops. Um, American, American lead goes into the bullets that British troops fire. Uh, American steel is used to produce um, ships, uh, weapons, and more. And so increasingly the United States is increasing its production, and increasingly the U.S. government is overseeing that production in order to maximize efficiency. Uh, and to kind of get you an idea how big these changes are, um, production skyrockets. Um, during the conflict because we just start producing more and more things and while u-boat sinkings do some damage Thanks to convoys and the fact that the Germans don't have enough torpedoes to sink all the ships we're sending um, We're the US is coming out ahead um, There's a thing called the Great Migration uh, Which many African Americans leave the rural south and move into industrial sectors in the north uh, to find more work. Essentially, the war creates opportunity for Americans of all walks of life. But Now, naturally, not everyone is thrilled about this war, um, and especially a lot of people are very upset about who the U.S. is starting to pick, because once the British Navy all but ensures that we side with the British, um, the German Americans, some of them are quite upset um, likewise, Irish Americans are quite upset. You might be asking, why are the Irish upset? Well, anyone who's an enemy of the British Empire is a friend of the Irish in this time period. Um, and so some people began treating Germans and, what and other sides with intolerance. You have the pacifists who are opposed to war. Um, and this is kind of what makes uh, the U.S. involvement in the war a bit slow as well, is there's kind of this mentality of we don't really want to get into the war right away um, because one, we're not ready um, as a country, and two, there's very deep divides amongst American people. Um, but now one of the things we're going to see as the war breaks out, the United States government kind of acquires a mentality of, um, well, our textbook says it trespassed on individual liberties to quiet dissent or differing opinions. I would say the U.S. government kind of takes a totalitarian turn, where it essentially adopts this mentality of, our goal is to win the war. Um, shut up. But. So during the war, the United States will put in a couple of laws. One of these is the Espionage Act, which basically silenced freedom of press. Essentially, anyone who's engaged in disloyal or treasonable activities um, is, con is conducting espionage. Um, then in 1918, the Espionage Act was expanded by the Sedition Act. And basically what this said is you can't criticize the U.S. government, the Constitution, or military forces and targeted freedom of speech. You cannot question the government, you can't write about the government um, if you're not writing in favor of what the government is doing. That's what these laws do. Um, First Amendment, um, well, there's phrases for it. Now, our textbook makes a big deal about how these are two separate things, but most people get charged for both uh, when they get hauled off to court. And our textbook notes a few famous examples. 
but you can see like you get accused of espionage and then if you complain about the espionage act you get charged with the sedition act and so this is how it usually goes you protest about the draft you protest about protecting corporate interests in the case of uh, kate richards o'hare um, you get accused of the viola violating the espionage act you complain the espionage act is violating your freedom of freedom of press or freedom of speech and you get the sedition act slapped on you and so often it's a twofer um, you do one you're probably going to get the other one if you um, try and take opposition to it anyways but as I stated before, there's a lot of economic opportunities opening up in this conflict, um, especially how the when the war breaks out and the draft kicks in. Most of the Americans who get drafted to go fight in World War One are um, white European descent Americans. Uh, there's a fair number of African Americans who serve as well, and there's actually a very large contingent of Native Americans as well. Our textbook doesn't really pay a whole lot of attention to that, unfortunately. Um, but if you run the numbers uh, statistically, some of the highest participation based on population statistics um, that come out of uh, Native Americans. Um, and, of course, there's the Harlem Hellfighters as well. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of people fighting in the war. But our textbook focuses more heavily on what's going on at home. Because, quite frankly, the... World War, we show up in 1917, and the war ends pretty quick. Um, but that's because the war has been going on for quite some time, and we're late to the party. But the home front changes in ways that um, have a long-lasting effect. So women, African Americans, Mexican Americans, they're able to find new opportunities that um, white, male, European descent Americans have been occupying. Uh, you see a lot of African Americans migrate, the Great Migration up north to take factory jobs up there. As you can see here, the map here, um, African Americans uh, move in numbers, that, and this continues into World War II. And that's why you have large African American populations in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, is because work opportunities opened up and people moved. After the Civil War, not as many Amer African Americans left where they were um, because there wasn't necessarily opportunities, and moving this much is a tremendous risk on a family, on an individual. But when you know pretty much they're hiring people right off the street, there's European immigrants aren't flowing in anymore, as that chart above showed us. Um, 97% decrease in European immigrants. Essentially, factory jobs still need to be filled, and even though this is a time period of racism and sexism, uh, when the going gets tough, when the economy needs it, um, anyone can answer that call. Um, that seems to be the trend, at least, in American capitalism. Anyways, let's take a look at our doughboys on the front. Um, essentially what happens is after the Zimmerman telegram, um, I'll talk about that more in class, um, but essentially what happens is the United States enters the war in spring 1917, and the war has been dragging on. Um, essentially the, what's, what's happened in World War I is you have industrial nations fighting industrial nations. Um, defensive technology is vastly superior to offensive technology. So like machine guns are way too heavy to really move easily, but you set it in one place and it replaces 100 soldiers. Um, likewise, you have artillery that can take out a city block, but the problem is, is it's not very mobile. Um, and so a lot of the technology is designed to hunker down, kill anything that gets too close. And so much of the war, most students drive more in a day than the war moved in the entire um, years that it was fought in, um, on the Western Front. That's just how the war went. And so that's kind of how this, this front has been working out. Um, but to really get an idea of the industrial scale of the war, this is the casualty list. 
So the blue shows the blue at the top here shows the total number of troops mobilized. The purple shows how many were wounded, killed, or missing. Um, and so if you look at it, like places like Russia, it's 50-50. There's a one in two chance almost that when you went off to war, when you were drafted to go off to the war, you didn't come back. Or if you did, you were wounded for life, or you just disappeared. Russia also has a revolution at this time uh, during the war, and so some people just disappear. Anyways, you'll see that the British Empire doesn't have as heavy of a casualties, um, and that's partially because um, they have a wide base of people to pull, and they kind of it takes a while for them to get the whole empire mobilized to fight in this conflict. Um, you notice in France it's particularly ugly. Um, you're more than likely to have died, been killed, or, or went missing in this conflict if you were French. You might be asking, why is this number so high? Well, if you remember, the Eastern Front is this massive stretch of land. Well, this is the, the entire Western Front, from here to here. Basically, the French are defending their homelands. Tons of things in between these lands are leveled and destroyed horrendously. Um, villages, hills are knocked, are wiped off the face of the earth. Um, and the French are basically fighting for their lives. This is where Paris is. Um, the stakes are high for France. Italy, um, once again, pretty low casualties. You'll see the United States, we enter the war so late that you really don't see a huge impact of casualties on our end. Um, likewise, the Japanese, they fight entirely on the, east, um, on the Pacific front, and they finish most of their operations within about six months of the war breaking out. Meanwhile, in the Central Powers, um, it's, almost, it's practically 50-50 there. It's the Austria-Hungary is particularly has a particularly ugly time, and well, even though Turkey's casualties are pretty low and they don't recruit a lot of people, um, the Ottoman Empire disappears in this war. So there's that doesn't end. It they don't end well for them. But the point of the industrialized war: both sides have machine guns, both sides have massive artillery pieces, both sides have tons and tons of troops and resources, and essentially an industrialized conflict like this one. It's just the grinding of gears. Um, each side feeds the machine that is the war machine, which is troops, uh, civilian lives, pro machinery, equipment. Um, at the stage when the U.S. enters the war, a lot of people aren't too terribly concerned about U.S. troops. I mean, they perform incredible, uh, in incredible feats when they're there, but most Europeans, you know, most Europeans are like, eh, we don't really care if they're that competent. There's just this realization that the U.S. war machine is starting to go start up. Meanwhile, the French, the British, and definitely the German one, they've they pretty much run out of fuel. They've run out of people. They've run out of resources to keep and food to keep fighting. Uh, whereas the, there's this with the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, they realize, oh, a new machine is starting up. We don't have enough fuel to fight to fight on. But, no, so, it's a grim, grim way of looking at industrialized warfare, but that's kind of how it works. Um, there's one historian, I think it was Winters, he wrote, it was about memorials after the war, he wrote that some, many Europeans felt like they were survivors atop piles of corpses. Um... And that's kind of a mentality. Any city you go to, any village you go into in Europe, you're going to find World War I memorials. We'll talk about some of that impact in the 1920s in our next unit. Anyways, um, the United States comes into the war. Uh, we have Woodrow Wilson, so he's a big fan of the moral diplomacy, which his big slogan was peace without victory. But... Essentially, Woodrow Wilson put forward what is called the 14 points, and his mentality was is if we had followed these 14 points before the war, we wouldn't have had a great war. And by great, I mean terrible, destructive, and big hawking conflict. And so Wilson's 14 points are as follows. Make no secret diplomatic agreements. 
Um, I'll talk about this in class, but essentially this is entirely what drove the conflict. People declare war on each other, not realizing that they had big friends behind them. The Serbs had the Russians, and the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians had the Germans. Anyways, allow freedom of seas during in peace and war. This is speaking directly to the open submarine warfare, unter Seeboot warfare. Remove as many economic barriers as possible between countries. Essentially, the United States, um, with our industrial might, we want to get rid of tariffs because we can use our industrial might to ensure economic stability for at least our country. Um, but also, the idea of free trade is kind of a nice idea as well. Um, but reduce stockpiles of military armaments to the lowest point for domestic safety. Uh, this kind of speaks to, like, look at the Germans. The German Navy was built for one purpose, to destroy the British Navy. The French Navy was built up heavily for one purpose, to counteract, counteract the German Navy or perhaps the, the British Navy. Um, depending on who you ask um, and when you ask, the French and the British are not always the greatest friends. Um, the other thing that Woodrow Wilson was concerned about, he was anti-colonial in a lot of ways, was just colonial claims, giving more weight to the views of colonized people. Essentially, local rule should rule, is kind of what he's arguing there. Of course, he kind of gives exceptions to that sometimes. But anyways, evacuate restored Russian territory seized during the war. That's talking to, about the Brest-Litvisk, I apologize for mispronouncing anything, uh, treaty where essentially the Germans pulled the Russians out of the war. Um, and took a bunch of land from them because they knew the Russians were in no position to, well, take it back. Uh, restore and protect Belgium's sovereignty. Um, the Germans got the jump on the French initially because they invaded through Belgium and in the process kind of burned Belgium to the ground. Um, actually, that's really what got the British involved in the conflict. They were very upset about the Belgians being taken out. Anyways, um, this will never happen again because the Nazis do the exact same thing in World War II, run through Belgium to attack France. Anyways, um, number eight, restore French territory and settle the debate over Alsace-Lorraine. Um, essentially, the Germans and the French have been passing back and forth Alsace-Lorraine. It's a province between... It's a province between the two places. It actually used to be a medieval kingdom as well. Anyways... Um, Currently, since France won World War II, by technicality, um, Alsace-Lorraine is French presently. Um, after World War, uh, before in the before the before World War One, it was German. After World War One, it was French. When the Nazis took it, it was German. Um, but the French won World War II technically, so now it is French to this day. Um. I want to go there someday. It sounds like a fun place. Anyways, um, number nine, adjust Italy's borders according to the nationalities of populations living there. Um, this is kind of one of those weird things. If you don't know about Italian culture and politics, um, not all Italians think of themselves uh, as Italians. Yeah, that's kind of different. Um, number ten, allow the Austro-Hungarian Empire to choose their own governments the peoples of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Essentially, Austria-Hungary is made up of multiple um, ethnic groups, and um, let's just say this. Uh, when there's ethnic disputes in Central Europe, there's going to be a world war. At least that's what caused the last two world wars. Um, I studied that a bit in college, and it's an interesting topic. There's a lot of people, different people running around, and they don't necessarily all like each other. Um, number 11, redraw the boundaries of the Balkan states based on nationalities and historical alliances. Um, basically, Wilson's ideas break down into economics, um, peace, and self-rule. That's kind of the big ideas that he pushes forward. Um, likewise, number 12, separate the Ottoman Empire into independent countries according to nationalities and guarantee all nations right access to the Darnells. That's the Black Sea. Um, to the AGNC connecting point. 13, restore and protect Poland as a sovereign state with access to the sea. Basically, a strong Poland weakens Russia, weakens Germany, and weakens an Austro-Hungarian empire. But 
Uh, number 14, establish an association of nations to provide collective security and ensure peace. So once again, Wilson's 14 points are either deal with economics, they deal with um, self-rule, uh, and they try and prevent further, con further future conflict. Most of Wilson's points will be promptly ignored. Um, if we take the example of the breaking up of the Ottoman Empire, the British and the French split it up, and the Middle East never had any problems ever again. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Um, you, if, if you believe that, uh, clearly you don't keep up with the news that's been going on for the past 50-plus years. Anyways, the only thing that he really gets in his, um, in his 14 points is point number 14. They agree to... Um, Allied powers agreed to put together a League of Nations. Anyways, um, that's what this is saying here. Is the French and the British, this is the imperialism, nationalism, European model for wars. Um, the, the British and the French are figuring, okay, we won the Great War. Let's set the board for the next one so that the Germans, we can crush them easier next time. Um, that's kind of the mentality that the... That the um, that is taken. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles um, is put together, and you'll hear about the Treaty of Versailles in future units, um, particularly in U.S. History 3 and definitely in World History. But essentially, the Treaty of Versailles takes the 14 points, chucks it out the window, and says, it's Germany's fault. Um, and Britain and France are awesome. And you owe us money. Actually, everyone owes us the United States money when it's all said and done. Anyways, um, ironically, the United States will, well, perhaps not ironically, I think I'm misusing the word, America will reject the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, essentially what happens is the United States under Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson is a Democrat, and not all Democrats believe in, it, in him anymore, and of course the Republicans certainly don't. Um, and so what happens is America's Senate, um, splits along three party lines. Um, and it's important to know what these three ones are. Essentially, the Wilson Democrats, while they don't like the Treaty of Versailles, it's not the 14 points, they believe that uh, it's the only way that we can get things going towards you know, world peace and maybe getting the 14 points set up, and wanted the U.S. to join the League of Nations. Um, we have the reservationists, who are essentially mostly Demo Democrats who just, they don't fully support Wilson anymore, and they, don't, they have some questions. Uh, they would accept the treaty if it was modified. They believe that the League of Nations is unconstitutional. Essentially, by creating a global organization, it weakens the power of the United States as an individual country. Also, they really didn't like Article 10 of the League Covenant, the founding document of the League of Nations, which basically obligated the U.S. to defend other members under certain circumstances. There's a lot of Americans who are thinking, you know what? We like isolationism. We got involved in this stupid war, um, but now we're done. Let's go home. And then you've got the irreconcilables. Um, they opposed the treaty in any form. They felt the Treaty of Versailles was stupid and the League of Nations was evil. Uh, speaking of that, they were convinced the idea of the League of Nations was idealistic and unrealistic. And they were suspicious of the intents of other countries in the League of Nations. Because, you know, everyone's in the League and the United States doesn't agree with everyone. Um, most people don't agree with everyone. And they wanted to turn back the clock and focus on American isolationism. But, what can you do? Um, the irreconcilables and reservationists would win out. Essentially, the United States would reject, reject the Treaty of Versailles, and we would never join the League of Nations, even though it was Wilson's idea. Um, essentially, the United States said, well, fine, we got involved in the war, now we're done, let's go home. And leave us alone. So that kind of wraps up this presentation. Um, it's a bit long-winded, and it goes through a lot of information. Uh, when I give it in class, it'll probably be much more segmented and more compartmentalized. Um, so, um, but just to keep in mind the vocab terms for U.S. History uh, to World War One, those are going to be listed on 
the other, the previous video. That's where they're listed, and you can get the Quizlet link. I'll be sure to put that in the description below. Um, just to my viewers, uh, hopefully there are viewers. I understand there's not a lot of students who are actually using these videos. That's okay. I'm going to make them anyways. Um, say la vie, and it's your loss. Uh, and nobody's actually watching this section. Hmm. Oh, well. Um, let's call it quits here, and until later.